Welcome back to Kids Discover Egypt Day 4. Are you guys excited for Kids Discover Egypt Day 4? I can't hear you out there. Are you excited? Yeah! All right, that sounds great. My name is Diego Rigoyen. This is my co-host, Hatshepsut. And today, we're going to be making our very own papyrus paper. It's not real papyrus, but it's close enough. So in today's activity, it's kind of a two-part activity. So you'll start off by making your papyrus paper, and then after that, once it's dry, you get to actually decorate your papyrus paper however it is you want to. So in today's activity, we'll need to start off with some heavyweight paper. Now this could be watercolor paper, Bristol paper, or some kind of art paper that says it's heavyweight. You don't want to use printer paper because this is going to get wet and the printer paper is just not strong enough for this kind of activity. So make sure that you have some kind of heavy weighted art paper. After that, you're gonna need some scissors. You're gonna need a cup of water. You're gonna need a cup of flour. You're not gonna use it all, but it's good to have a little bit of extra. You're going to need a bowl to mix the two materials together. And then you're also gonna want a stirring stick of some kind. And then you're gonna need some protective material for your table, whether or not that's a foil or maybe a piece of wax paper. You can use any of that in order to protect your table and move your papyrus paper around once you're done working on it. And then once that part is done, you're gonna to need to set your papyrus paper in the sun for a couple of hours and allow for it to dry completely. Once your papyrus paper is dry, then you can bring it back inside and you will be able to decorate it. Now to decorate your papyrus paper, you can use markers, but if you have paint at your house, it's okay to paint on this. It's gonna be strong enough and thick enough to paint on. So if you wanna be more like the ancient Egyptians and paint on your papyrus paper, you can do so. But if you don't have paint, a marker collection would work just fine for this one. So without further ado, let's jump right into today's activity. Okay, for this project, we'll need a bowl of some kind. You're gonna need some heavy weighted paper. It will be getting wet, so you wanna make sure it's a heavy weight type paper. We're gonna need about a quarter cup of flour. Probably won't use it all. And then you'll need a cup of water some kind of stirring stick. And then you will need some scissors. You're also going to need something that is water resistant. Here we have wax paper, but you can use foil paper uh, or anything like that at home. And something to color. And for this project, you can use paint. Uh, but if you don't have paint, you can use markers. Markers will work better than color pencils. The first thing we need to do is cut this sheet of paper into strips. And we'll get started. We're just gonna cut this sheet of paper into about half inch strips. strips of paper. Let's count them out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So we have 13 strips total. We're going to use seven of our strips for the back side and the other six are actually going to cut in half. So we can fold it kind of loosely like that. And we're gonna take our scissors and cut it in half, just like that. So there's no crease in it. So now we have 12 pieces of paper, just like that. And then we have seven long pieces of paper like that. Now we're gonna take our bowl and we're gonna add some water to the bowl. Probably too much water. So 
add some water to the bowl. Not too much water. And then we're going to add a little bit of flour. Not all of the flour, just a little bit. And if you want to be more precise, you can get a tablespoon and use a tablespoon. And now, with our stirring straw or stick, and if you really wanted to, you could just use your finger, we're going to stir around the flour and the water together, just like this. You want to make sure that all of the flour breaks up in the water. Okay, so it's not super thick. And it's not very runny. And add a little bit more flour. Stir it up a little bit more. Make sure to get all those clumps of flour out. Okay, that looks pretty good. It's kind of just like a white consistency of water. So now we want to take our protective sheet, and this can be either aluminum or wax paper or anything like that. And we're going to start with our long strips. And we're going to take our strip of paper and we're going to put it in. And this is where things might get messy, but we're going to put it in the flour water. And we're going to let it get all wet and pull it through. Make sure the whole thing is in the flour water. And something I like to do before I lay it down is squeeze any excess water out so that you don't get too much water on your surface. And you're going to put your piece down and then we'll do the next piece. Put it in the flour water. Make sure that it all gets covered in the flour water. And then you're gonna overlap the last piece. Not entirely, but just enough. A little less than half, you're gonna overlap it. Next sheet. Into the flour water. All the way through. And again, overlapping that last piece, just like that. I'm going to keep going. And now we're going to overlap that one too. So now our shorter, you can see our shorter pieces of paper are actually just as tall as this one. So now we're going to dunk this shorter paper in. We're going to dunk our shorter paper in our flower water. And then we're going to overlap all of the strips that we have down already, just like that. We'll do the next one. Overlap that last one that we just laid down. Okay. And we'll keep going until we're all done.
take our last piece and we just overlap that last half. And it's okay if you have a little extra like that. And then what we're gonna do, this is where the protective sheet becomes really important, is now you can pick this up all together and you're gonna take it outside and let it sit in the sun for a little bit. And you wanna make sure that the paper is completely dry before you go on to the next step. So you'll take this and put it in the sun until it's dry. Okay, we're back now and our papyrus paper has dried. You may have to leave it in the sun for a few hours, or the way we did it is we actually left it overnight, uh, and that ensures that it will be dry by the time you work on it. And you can see now the edges have kind of curled up, and it's actually very stiff, and it's stuck to the paper, but it'll peel off nice and easy. So here is our papyrus paper. And now what we can do is we can actually begin to draw on it. And what the Egyptians would do is they would usually use papyrus paper to tell stories or to show how they lived or some of the things that they wish for. So uh, what you can do on yours is something similar. You can r make a drawing about your house or you can make a drawing about something that you wish would happen or you wish you had. And, uh, and one of the ways that the Egyptians would organize their drawings is into different sections. So they might have a top section here and then a second section here, almost like a book. So you can organize your drawing in that way too and you can divide it into sections like this or like this, however you choose to do it. So I think I might have a couple of sections. I might have one section that is kind of big over here and another section that goes top here and bottom here. So you can think about how you want to divide yours. You can divide it however you want. You don't have to copy me. Uh, and I would maybe sketch some things out in pencil before you get started. So on this side, I think what I'm going to draw is a little picture of my house. And then over here, I think what I'll have is me walking. Let's just do stick figures for our sketch here. I'm going to be walking my cat because my cat goes on walks. I know not everyone's cat goes on walks. Usually dogs are the one that go on walks, but my cat likes to go on walks too. There's, there's me walking my cat. Remember, this is just sketching, sketching the ideas out. So I hope you can see that. I'm sure you'll see it better when there's some color. And then I'm not sure what I'm gonna put in this section yet. I think I'm gonna start coloring this section and then as I get some ideas, I'll think about what's going in my last section. Okay, so I have my house, these are my stairs, here's my red door, and here's a little bench on my porch, and then here are a couple pillars, and now we're going to move on to me drawing myself and my cat. So there I am, I drew myself kind of like an Egyptian, that same style, and there's my cat. And then I think I'm gonna add some grass. 
My cat really likes to roll around in the grass. And then another thing I wanted to do is usually they have lines that separate their sections. So if you want to make these lines really straight, you can get a ruler and draw the lines with the ruler, or you can just do it freehand. Okay, and now I think I'd like to add some symbols from this symbol sheet. And I think I'm going to go ahead and add the heart. Because I really like my cat. To the ancient Egyptians, the heart symbolizes life. And it was the center of all thoughts and understanding. So the Egyptians didn't think that the brain was very important, but the, the heart was extremely important to them. And kind of like my cat. It was really important to me. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. So another thing I thought of is in my backyard, we have a nice vegetable garden. So I think I'm going to draw the vegetable garden that we have. And I think that would be a nice way to round out the little story that I want to tell. So we can draw a couple stalks of corn. And the next big thing we have is tomatoes. And I want to add some red dots around so that you can tell these are tomatoes. And then the last really fun thing that we have are some sunflowers. Very nice. So there's my papyrus drawing. It kind of tells a story. I live in a house. I like to walk my cat. And we have a nice vegetable garden. So I hope you have fun telling your story. And uh, I look forward to seeing some of your drawings. So we're going to now join Brian. And he's going to tell us a little bit more about the ancient Egyptians and what they would write down and draw on their papyrus paper. Hello, my name is Brian Kramer. I am a research Egyptologist at the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art on the California State University San Bernardino campus. And today I'm going to explain to you a little bit about making papyrus and using papyrus to write documents as they did in ancient Egypt. Now you may be watching this as part of uh, the Kids Discover Ancient Egypt workshop, and you may have actually made your own papyrus as part of the activities in that workshop. And I'm gonna show you how they did that in ancient Egypt using some real papyrus. But first of all, I wanna point out uh, the object on display in the Journey to the Beyond um, exhibit, uh, which represents uh, the piece of papyrus um, that relates to the afterlife here. It is a, a part of the book of the Amduat, um, which if you go to Egypt, you may see inscribed on the walls of the tombs of the Valley of the Kings. Now, if you look closely, you can see that we have reconstructed the position of the fragments of this papyrus in their approximate locations based on the many examples of this kind of text that exist. And let's be honest, it doesn't look like it's in a very good state. <laughs> and that's because papyri don't last um, very in well intact over the thousands of years that they have uh, survived. Some papyri are up to, to 4,500 years old. And so this kind of document doesn't look as good um, as it did when it was first made. So don't feel too bad if you don't like the looks of your own papyrus. Um, everything evens out in the end. So I'm gonna show you here uh, part of the process that we imagine the ancient Egyptians used to create papyrus. 
Um, unfortunately, they did not leave for us a manual for how to do this, and so it was only a process that was discovered in the 20th century, and it's still, some of the elements are still debated. Um, I don't know what you used for your own uh, papyrus document, but you could try it with actual papyrus. If you live in a, a warm part of uh, the world, you might be able to, to um, get uh, stalks of papyrus. You might be able to cut them yourselves. I actually cut these out of my garden yesterday. You can uh, get papyrus in California in any garden shop. Um, it's not necessarily the papyrus that the ancient Egyptians used uh, to make paper, but it gives you a sense of what the plant looks like. Um, and if you've seen the plant, then it can be quite tall. Mine, unfortunately, is, is kind of miniature because I haven't, I haven't put it in the best soil to grow. Um, and so this is a small version of what the larger version would be. But a papyrus plant is um, generally a series of stalks that grow out of the ground, out of a rhizome that's planted in a very watery soil. And it looks approximately like this. It has a stalk and it has a set of flowers on the end. You cut the flowers off. They're not actually useful for the process of making paper. And you take the stalk and you strip from the stalk using a knife uh, as carefully as possible, um, the outer coating. Oop. Yeah, this one is really thin up here. So let's just start it from the bottom. And the stalks are very pithy and they have these grains that allow you to cut it pretty easily. You want to cut all the green parts off until it's down to the inner white part. And from here, your goal is to make long rectangular strips that you can lay lengthwise. You can see why this would be a lot easier if you had something that was bigger than this. Not all papyrus is useful for making into sheets of papyrus paper. Um, in fact, only one subspecies of the scientific plant uh, named Cypress papyrus, uh, Linnaeus, is useful for this process. And you have to get the right one, or you just end up with a pile of sticks. <laughs> and the right one is a papyrus that has a natural adhesive resin in it, a sap that makes it very good at sticking together. Right, yeah, I'm not really very practiced at this, so my example is not going to look good. <laughs> but it's to illustrate how it works. All right, so two sides of a very small piece of papyrus. So let's cut another one and try that one out. You can go to Egypt nowadays and buy papyrus. It's actually go to papyrus boutiques in places like Luxor and see them make this as a process in front of you. And they actually are following the, the method that was reconstructed as, as, uh, in, as best we can figure out in the 20th century. And it seems to work pretty well. It's, it has some discrepancies with actual papyrus but we don't know why that is. It's probably to do with the plant. The plant has just evolved over thousands of years and it's no longer naturally occurring in Egypt. The environment changed significantly enough in the last 2000 years that you cannot go find um, natural papyrus stands in the places that they used to live in Egypt and the Delta. You can go further south into Sudan and, and still find uh, forests of natural papyrus, 
but most of what people use nowadays is grown on farms. Um, and uses something like what you can get in the store. Anyway, so principle is you cut enough pieces to make the crisscross lattice of a sheet of papyrus, right? And if you're practiced, you've probably done this several times and you know what you're doing. If you're not practiced, this is an experiment. All right, that's the principle of it. Okay, that's all I'm going to go with the principle. Um, what you then do is you cover what you have put together and you get strong boards and a mallet and you hit it. Enough to flatten the pieces together. And in that process, what happens is that you're breaking the cell walls of the, of the papyrus um, stalks and releasing the natural sap inside, which is an adhesive that will begin to bind the fibers together. You then take what you have, and as you can see, this really hasn't worked that well because it's not the right type of papyrus and I didn't prepare it correctly. But what you get, if you know what you're doing, is uh, a very raw piece of papyrus that you then lay out to dry and magically over a very little time it is a sheet that you then can trim to the size that was uh, convenient um, for writing with. And the ancient Egyptians maintained a, a writing surface for, for their documents that's approximately this size. So this is a, a probably a, a pretty good idea of what it could look like after you were done. Okay. So that's making a papyrus. So taking your new piece of papyrus, you can begin to write a Egyptian um, text. Now, in ancient Egypt, papyrus was actually kind of expensive, so you tried to economize on using as, uh, the text, uh, the, the papyrus as, um, as much as possible. So sometimes people reuse papyri a lot uh, to um, write texts over texts, but a new sheet of papyrus would look like this. And uh, the reason I'm sitting on the floor is because that's the traditional posture for ancient Egyptian scribes. Um, they are usually depicted just like this, uh, cross-legged, um, and they'd have uh, a kilt that would could be uh, tightened with their legs and that would actually be the writing surface like the desk that they could use. They might also use a writing board um, especially for young um, uh, scribes who were practicing, you, you could write on a writing board. And so they would uh, have the papyrus in front of them. They would have their case of reed pens. They're actually made of just a stalk of a, of a rush that they, um, that they would chew on the end of to make into a little bit of a brush. Yep. It breaks up the fibers a little bit and so you can actually inscribe a text. Um, and then they would use a scribal palette. Now this is a really rudimentary um, version of one of these, but it functionally works the same way as the ancient Egyptians did. Their ink was carbon, so they would take burnt sticks and grind them up in the wood um, palette that they have in a, a little recess um, here that would hold the ink. Um, scribes always had a jar of water. Um, you frequently see them with these behind their ears. You just add a little bit of water to the ink and if it works its magic it makes black ink. You can see there's another red dot here and that's because that is the traditional 
scribal repertoire, you get red or ink or black ink. Black ink is for the text that you are trying to copy or write, and the red ink is for correction. Or for special text that, for one reason or another, can't be written in um, black. That's uh, sometimes e the names of evil creatures. Um, other times it's like headings, just to indicate what the, the contents of what you're writing are. Okay, so if you know ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, you know that this is not ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. This is hieratic. It is the calligraphic, um, the cursed version of hieroglyphs. It's what people actually used when they, preferentially um, what people used when they inscribed documents like this. It's the, it's the thing that everyone knew, um, who could read. It's a lot harder <laughs> to, um, write hieroglyphs using this system and it, it was usually reserved for special documents especially uh, religious documents um, like the book of the dead uh, to be used um, for uh, in temples or in tombs and there's an, an intermediary between actually doing hieroglyphs and doing hieratic and that's cursive hieroglyphs um, and you can you can write books of the dead using that too um, but that's the general process preferentially people write uh, on documents like this, starting from the right and going to the left, um, as uh, in uh, Arabic or Hebrew nowadays. And uh, for a um, papyrus, the, the place that you want to start is on the, the side where the, um, the grain of the papyrus is horizontal. That is the preferential side, that's called the recto. Uh, if there's already a text on that side, you can actually use the other side it's not it's not prohibited but it's not as easy um, so most documents start on the rector side and go to what's called the verso side and if i were to receive this as a letter for example from someone this is actually the beginning of a letter if i received this as a letter i could reuse that piece of papyrus and write my, my response around the text that they sent me um, i could say you know this uh, this is what you're saying is not true. Uh, I don't understand why you're yelling at me so much. Um, love and kisses are a son Tashidu. And then send it back, um, for example. And so that people reuse paper a lot. Um, and papyrus is difficult to make, and you now know why. And so you can see a little bit of the motivation for why you would want to reuse something like this. But that's how it was done in ancient Egypt. I hope you guys have had as much fun as, as this is by itself.